chapter 4. I will offer again, if anybody has something that's kind of on your heart or your mind, uh, we could talk about that too. I don't mind. If you've been studying something, you're like, yeah, I'd really like to know a little bit more about that. No? All right, well, let's look at 1 Peter chapter 4, uh, verse 17 through, um, what have we got, 19? <clears throat> Anybody want to take those few verses? Go ahead, Isaac. For the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God, and if it first begin in us, what shall the end of them that obey not the gospel of God? And if the righteous scarcely be saved, where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? Wherefore, let them that suffer according to the will of God commit the keeping of their souls to him in well doing as unto a faithful creator. All right, so one of the things, uh, I guess, uh, you know, just to throw out kind of a question out there, um, how do you, what do you think whenever um, it comes down to, you know, how a Christian is supposed to judge? You know, how does, how does that work in relation to uh, the world? What do you think? Christians and judgment and you're I mean we're not just judging ourselves we're like judging others here well how are we supposed to how are we supposed to to deal with that what do you think yeah verse 17 sounds like holding ourselves to a higher standard in each other than in the world here when it says um, you know the first began at us which shall the envy of them that will be not God before God that sounds a lot more like we're holding each other to a higher standard you know this standard right right yeah, it certainly is. Uh, Isaac, what, what did you have? You also have, like, the uh, in the same tangent, you have the uh, forever misquoted or misused context of uh, judge not lest thou shalt be judged as, a, as the context of being, you need to uh, first assess yourself, like, uh, in the same way, like, yeah, verse, like, as you're saying, verse 17 is like, if we're going to be first, so we can, like, accurately go out into the world and, like, I guess assess it. It's like it says, like you need to take out the split in your eye, your own eye first before you take out the log in your brother's eye. Right. Now, how would you? I mean, how would you effectively do that? I mean, both of y'all said some very similar things. You know, to take to judge the speck that's in the beam that's really in your eye, right? To or to hold yourself to a higher standard. How would you do that as a, as a believer? How could you judge properly in those things? What do you think? Holy Spirit is supposed to guide you in that. Like you, as you're like you're reading and like studying the scripture, things will often like you might need to change to get to you. And also, of course, there's other people. Of course, like other body believers will help you in that regard as well. Yeah. Now, what if I see, what if I see somebody that's not a believer doing something that I know is contrary to the scriptures? Do I have any kind of right to judge that situation at all? Oh, we don't need to because that judgment's that's not up to us. That's already been done. And um, I think people in the world often say, like, if we, if we were to point out that, you know, that's God's already judging you on that. Mm -hmm. That gets projected because now we're judging them. Right. If we were to confront them on that. Yeah, that's that's very important to understand that we don't have to. There are there are things that God has already judged, correct? And if we see something going on. We don't approach it as we are issuing judgment, but that God has judged these things already. The scriptures have judged these things. And you will, you will come in contact with people. Sometimes you'll come in contact with those who say, well, they believe in God, but don't you're not supposed to judge me. Well, if you know there's a God, you are recognizing the fact that he has set aside a standard in this universe. That there are laws that he has issued that govern. Uh, you know, we we experience the law of gravity every single day, right? But the law that says thou shalt not commit adultery has just as much strength as the law of gravity. In fact, the law of gravity is is a little bit can be broken before the 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 commandment that I shall not commit adultery. Does that make sense? Because, uh, because gravity is built in, in the creation, whereas thou shalt not commit adultery is built in eternity. 
Does that make sense? Of the spirit, yeah. yeah. It, I mean, it is, it is one of those things that, that judges the heart of holiness. Gravity, you know, you can be holy without gravity, right? But the two are just as real. They, and they can and the experience is just as as just as much. So when we when believers are called to judge things, you know the first thing that we do is we we hold ourselves to a higher standard, just like Josh said that we we judge our group. Okay, we judge our group and we judge our group by God's by God's standard, and it's okay. Okay, it is okay for us to teach God's doctrines. That's what do, a lot of a lot of churches have gotten away from. They're like, well, we don't we don't teach doctrines. Well, doctrines is just God's rules. This is how He governs the universe. It's important to know how He governs. You know, if you are gonna, it's kind of like if you if you can still carry right. Um, there are certain states that will not recognize Arkansas's concealed carry. So if you are gonna go, if you have a concealed carry of Arkansas and you go to another state, you need to know what the law is concerning that, right? Or you're gonna end up with a felony and in jail and a very rough, you know, time as you venture through um, your ignorance of the law because ignorance of the law is no excuse. Does that make sense? <coughs> That's a tough one because you can't you can't sell a, a Second Amendment to anybody either. So you have to know the entire law. You have to know the middle ground law that they're enforcing, not the higher law. You've got to you, and and that's where judgment begins at the house of the Lord. You know when it, ju because if you're going to go to another state and you're going to still carry, you need to make sure you're doing it correctly. Even though the Constitution says you have the right to it, um, they may they may have their own modifications of that law whether it's right or wrong you know uh, you know the government there is going to ultimately decide I mean you can try to take it to court you can try to get it changed but it doesn't matter the policeman pulls you over and you are illegally concealed carrying uh, you're wrong even if you're like well I got my second amendment right he's like oh well, I'm not going completely by you, by the set of rules that you know we're going by my rules. I'm here to enforce this state's laws, not what you think they should be. It doesn't matter what you think. Does that make sense? And that's the way that's the way first speaker's talking about. It doesn't matter what you think. It matters what God thinks. He is the law giver. Does that make sense? And we are supposed to judge according to the standard of the law giver. That's that's what Peter is, is telling us, and that will bring us to that higher standard. Uh, of a, <clears throat> kind of a verse, uh, in fact, I, if somebody would look up a couple of verses for me. Acts 7 and verse 48, and then also uh, Romans 12, 1 and 2. Kaylin, you want to take that? Romans 12, 1 and 2. Noah, do you have Acts 7? I do. You do? Go ahead, Isaac. This is he that was in the church in the wilderness with the angel which spoke to him in the Mount Sinai and with our fathers who received the lively oracles to give unto us. That's Acts 748. It was 748. Okay. Yeah, 748. <clears throat> Albeit the Most High dwelleth not in the temples made with hands, as saith the prophet. You want to keep going? No, that, I think that's fine. So... Whenever we start holding that, that higher standard, we need to realize something about ourselves. That's, that's the point. Maybe I should have emphasized that before we went there. But here, you know, uh, Stephen, he, he's, he's reminding them. Really, what is he, who is he reminding? He's reminding those who are in the assembly together, right? These guys, they should know the rules. And he reminds them. The Most High does not just dwell in, he does not dwell in physical places, okay? He doesn't, he doesn't dwell there. He dwells somewhere else. He has somewhere else that he wants to dwell. Kaylin, what's that place? I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. 
And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God and what is good and acceptable and perfect. So here, I kind of I kind of skipped the verse that that says that the your body is the temple of God. But here, it, it references the body that the body is. The, your body, your physical body, is the thing that you're supposed to set aside for the Holy Spirit, for God to be in, okay? And you've got to judge this body first, right? We talked about, we've already kind of established that. Me first, the body of believers second, and then, you know, once we've taken care of all those beings, then we can take care of the specks, that are out in in the world, and we do have to go. We do have to approach that with this recognition that um, that those in the world do not understand God's laws. So we have to be the ones to explain those things. Just like if you're gonna if you're gonna exercise your right to bear arms with the Second Amendment. Um, your state's laws may not be the same as another state's laws, and you've got to be able to understand those. So a police officer will gladly explain the laws and judge you when you get there, right? So we are supposed to be like that. We're supposed to be able to understand how God works, understand his principles, and be able to explain those. And But before you can explain those, you have to understand those. That's why in 2 Timothy uh, 2.15 that we're supposed to study to show ourselves approved unto God. Workmen who needed not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. All right. Any more thoughts on that? Yes, sir. You say you get to like getting non-biblical arguments for that kind of thing? Or do you use the Bible to kind of like prove itself with like all this like cross-references within itself? Or do you just like, okay, I'm going to get arguments outside of the Bible to prove the points or the well, assertions? Well, I understand that question. Uh, Jesus used earthly stories to convey heavenly meanings. So if you, if you, can, if you can reference an earthly example, which you can, okay, because built into our worldly environment is God's laws, right? So you can absolutely use... Uh, the things that are commonplace to people to explain God's laws. It's kind of like the gender issue, right? All throughout the animal kingdom, you have how many genders? Two. Goldfish. Goldfish can change their gender. Goldfish can change their gender. Yeah. It's still two, though. It's still two. Yeah, it's going to be one or two. Now, now, is the goldfish? Does the goldfish have to go to a, a surgeon to 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 get it changed? I mean, it doesn't matter how much the the surgeon does. I mean, he's still, you know, DNA is DNA. It's always going to say boy or girl, right? When they did, I don't know about the a goldfish that changes its 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 gender. Um, when they dig it up in a thousand years, can they tell if it's a boy gold goldfish or a girl gold goldfish? I don't know because they they. Uh... They basically uh, change their uh, like sex to, in response to that they're not being the opposite sex. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. Like I, I, I don't. That would be an actual chromosome change, then. Just yeah, that's a DNA change, right? Yeah. So well, yeah, I guess it's whatever they ended up on. So I mean, I mean, and that's a that's a very that's a very simplified uh, uh, organism too. I mean, in the in the in the higher class. Supposedly, we're the most evolved, right? Yeah. So, unless we're going to devolve back into that state, I would say that we're stuck with either one or two genders. Um, and that's the animal kingdom that preaches that gospel of truth, right? So, you know, that's one of those things in the world. It's like, you know, things don't go around, you know, that, con that confused all the time. Um, so you could, I mean, so you've got you've got some of the laws of nature that that teach those type of things, that we can't we can't even we can't add an inch to our stature, we can't make hair grow on our head, even you know even as much as we lose it we can't we can't change it, you know even when it starts to change colors it's like you can dye it, but it's still it's still gonna be whatever whatever color it is underneath, 
that we can only we can only change the outward appearance a little bit, but what's inside is 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 something that's that's there. So yeah, we can use we can use things in the world to to illustrate godly principles. Jesus did it all the time. Now that might mean that you have to be kind of creative and uh, and think about such things before you do it, but. You know, uh, a lot of times people are going to have, they will agree with you on the earthly things, and then they'll disagree with you about heavenly things. And that's something, how, how that would work. But anyway, yeah, I think, I, think you, I think you could do it. I think you should do it, honestly. That way it becomes a little bit more real. You're not just talking about spiritual things. You're combining the spiritual and the physical together. So, any more thoughts on that? All right, let's look at verse 18 for a second. That scarcely saved. Oh, what do y'all think about that verse right there? In, this, is back in this is 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse, verse 18. It says, And if the righteous scarcely be saved, where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? I always found that that phrase is... I don't know. A not little bit of me just struggles to deal with it. Not everybody who calls me Lord, Lord will be uh, accepted in. So if like if people, it's not everybody who like claims me as their God or as their master is going to get in. There's there's no hope for like the lost or even saved. Uh, I think I think it kind of kind of goes along with that idea with with the ability to be saved from the tribulations of. You know, of life. Um, yeah. Go ahead. Somebody was going to say something. No? Okay, I thought I heard something. I was looking down and I just kind of heard something. Uh, here, listen to this verse just for a second. In Hebrews chapter 10, verse 38 and 39, if you want to, you can, you can turn there. It says, Now the just shall live by faith, but if any man draw back, my soul shall he have no pleasure in him. But we are not of them who draw back into perdition but of them that believe to the saving of the soul. So this goes along with, with what Isaac was saying, that there are those people that they're, they're pretenders, they're liars, they're not really saved to begin, to begin with. And, and Hebrews here, he says, the just shall live by faith, and that if any man draws back, and you know, you know, let's just talk about something for a second. It's not really in my notes, but... <clears throat> But if, if you're thinking that, well, scarcely saved, well, what is this talking about people that are backsliding? You know, the, that term, anybody know where we get that term backsliding? Is that a New Testament term? Is it an Old Testament term? It is an Old Testament term, okay? And it is often referred to Israel when Israel has ceased from following God and they have turned to idols and he says they they have slidden back okay now when you start looking at that terminology or that definition for backsliding Israel's lost as a goose right so God really isn't interested in backsliders because given the idea of a backslider means that well they have totally rejected God and they have sought other means. They knew the truth and they said no to the truth and yes to the lies and the and the false paganism of the world. That is a backslider in in a biblical sense. Does that make sense? Oftentimes whenever whenever we reference that, we're like, oh that's just somebody they, they were they said a prayer when they were five years old and they just kind of lived bad for you know, about 20 years, and then they come back to know the Lord later on. They were just backslidden, or maybe, or maybe they're still living in uh, a, a wrong way. I think one of the things that we need to get away from as believers is that true believers, those who have converted, that our minds are different, okay? The way that we think about sin has changed. It doesn't mean that you're never going to sin. But the way that you think about it, you agree with God, okay? You agree with God. That is something that never should change to a born-again person. You should always think God has a standard, right and wrong. It's black and white to God. It's black and white to me. Even if I do it, I agree with God. I messed up. Uh, and how you feel about it, 
how you feel about it should 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 change too. That oh, this is all everybody does it. It's okay. I'm only I'm not hurting anybody. A believer realizes that whenever you sin, that it ultimately ends in a something. What have What does the scripture tell us? That when sin comes in on the on uh, into play, what's the result? What do you think? Death. Sin always kills something. Okay? It always does. If you think that you can sin and not kill something, then you, you're, you're not thinking like God. You're not thinking like God, and you definitely don't have the heart of God. Every time. Okay? If you, you, know, if you lie to somebody, you know what you're going to kill? What do you kill if you lie? Trust. You kill trust every time. You, uh, if you, uh, if you cheat on your taxes, what are you going to kill? Hopefully, some federal program. <laughs> you're, no, you're going to kill your financial freedom because they're going to come for their money, and they're going and, and they're going to hold it thirty percent interest for the uh, for every month that you're behind. They're gonna. They will suck your your freedom away. Maybe y'all didn't know that. <coughs> it might not be thirty percent, but they do. It's worse than any credit card that you'll ever get. I guarantee it. All right. Sorry about my throat. It's so scratchy. I don't know why. <coughs> Another thing uh, about the scarcely saved. Uh, just kind of an idea behind it, because honestly, I don't know exactly what the phrase. Means <clears throat> we were talking about you know you know uh, backsliding and and being saved period, but it also may have the connotation that you may still have to go through tribulations. You may still have to go through things. You know, a lot of times people that are that are born again they wonder, well, why am I going through these things? And they let. They let the idea that, oh, I'm going through something, God must not love me, uh, get them in a, in a bad mindset. It doesn't mean that there's, that there's major sin involved, but not thinking rightly about, you know, your, uh, your participation in, in some tribulation in your life can lead you to, uh, to some ungodly thoughts about, well... It's not fair, God's not fair, and you, you start blaming God, and, and that can lead to, 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 a, to sinful thinking, even concerning God. You know, blaming, you know, blaming him, him for some things that, you know, maybe, maybe it's not really Him, or why He didn't, maybe why, why didn't God fix this thing in my life? You know, one of the things that we, we think and so I think as believers, you know, I'm just kind of, I'm just kind of putting my own, own thought process out there that I don't deserve to have to go through things. You know, I thought God was going to protect me from these things. The, Jesus said that you still live in this world and in this world you will have tribulation. This is John 16, 33. Good verse. Everybody turn to John 16, verse 33. <clears throat> because... You're going to go through things. Peter is, is, recognizes this, and he wants you to remember this, that just because you're saved doesn't mean that you will not go through things. <coughs> is everybody at John 16, verse 33? Mm -hmm. I want to make sure everybody's there. Sarah, would, would you read John 16, verse 33? These things I have spoken unto you, that in me you might have peace. In the world you should have peace. Tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. So Jesus even tells them the peace that I'm offering is knowing that all these things do have an end and that they are meant for a reason, that they have a purpose, even though those are sometimes very, very difficult to recognize. But he says, in this world, not you might have tribulation. Is that what it says? You will. So you shall. You shall. That's like will with a guarantee on the front, like a dollar sign. It's money. You're going to have tribulation. 
Right. Peter stole us about ten times in First Peter, I think. So. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I mean, it, it, yeah, we're he, he talk he talks about end time stuff. He talks about uh, just your regular life stuff that you know, you, um, a man and a wife. You know, they're they're gonna have their their relationship will never just be perfect. It's gonna be full of complications. Um, you guys that are single, you don't get out of it either. It's like you're gonna constantly have to deal with relationship issues. Um, if you have children, you're going to constantly have issues with your children, it seems like. If you have siblings, you're going to constantly have issues with your siblings. It's like there's no perfect place. There's nowhere that you can run from. But whenever things are going on, that you recognize God is doing something, even if I don't understand it, and you're able to take that step back and see a broader picture and accept it, God sh Teach me what I need to learn, okay? Your hands are open like this, and you're just like, I, I'm, just, I'm, I'm just a pure giver, and I'm going to take whatever it is and just rely on God's mercy. Let me tell you a story, okay? Y'all like stories, right? I'm going to give you a Bible story. So David has numbered God's people in the Old Testament. And God has told him, don't number God's people. Well, the prophet comes to David and says, David, you have sinned. God is going to bring judgment. And you, and he gives him three choices. See, there's some biblical to, the, to counting to three, right? God gives David three choices. And I can't remember exactly all the choices. I'm going to, I'm going to try to. He says something about, you know, you can, you can run from your enemies for a certain amount of time, or you can have um, uh, three months of, of, of war, or three days of, you know, just uh, of, of a pestilence from God. And David's looking at those, and he's like, there's none, none of those are good choices, right? But he looks at them, and he says, the most merciful out of all of those three, he looks at man and he's like, men, men have no mercy. So the first two, I'm not interested in the first two because those have to do with men's mercy. And I know that they don't carry men, much mercy. But he looks at the third one and he's like, God has mercy. And I'm just going to put my hands, in, I'm going to put myself in God's hands for three days. And God will do to me what he needs to do to help me learn the lesson that I need to learn. And that is a very, very difficult situation to put yourself in, but sometimes that's where we're at. And it may not always be because of our own personal sin. It may be because of just the environment that something around us, you know, that's why it, it's really important. You know, I got a few guys here. I'm just gonna kind of put something out there for you guys. Um, God is gonna look at you as the head of your household. And some of the things that's gonna that happens to your family will be a direct result of you and the decisions that you make. Now, that is that is one of those laws that's kind of written like gravity. Okay, God has put it on you, just like He did on Adam. Death was passed from one generation to the next because through Adam, because of what Adam did. If Eve, if it had just been Eve, God would have fixed that. But it wasn't just Eve, it was Adam. And that, that oversight has been delegated to the, the man of the, the head of the household, okay? So you need to remember that. Job, okay? Job, he recognized this fact. And he said, just in case my family has, has messed up and they've sinned, I'm sacrificing for them. He took responsibility as the head of the household to make sure that my children are sanctified. And he recognized that. But even at that, I mean, and Satan comes to the table to God, and God's like, have you considered my servant Job? He's perfect in all his ways. And Satan's like, oh yeah, I've seen him. You've protected him. You've got a hedge around him and everything that, he, that, that, that he's got his hands on. So what does that mean? Satan couldn't touch his family. Satan couldn't touch him. Satan couldn't touch his livestock, his servants, 
his territory, anything. Satan, Job's uh, window or umbrella was protected because he was sanctifying himself before God and making sure that he was taking care of his family. Guys, that's on you. You can protect your whole family if you are doing right, okay? So I'll, I'll get off that for a moment because I know I've got two ladies in here. You're like, but, you know, what you, what you got to do is you, you got to make sure that, that, that your guys understand that. And, and, you know, and I hate to break it to you, guys do not receive that very well from, from the lady folks. They're, they're not going to receive it very much. But for you, you got to make sure that your, yours is already there. For, for you, you know, they, the scriptures need to, need, to be, need to be everywhere. Talked about on the radio, in the songs. It needs to be a major part of your life. Provided it's already there. It's like that, you know, if they don't know to do that, then, you know, that's how you're going to have to encourage it. Because you're not going to be able to force it down their throat. They're not going to accept it. They just won't. They'll think, oh, you're judging me, right? They're going to think that you're judging them, and they're not going to, re they're not going to receive that well. I mean, that's just, that's just my two cents, you know, for, for what it's worth. Um, it, <clears throat> so anyway, pressing on with that. Anybody have any more comments on that? I feel like I'm preaching at you guys just a little bit. I don't mean to. Uh, look at verse 19. It says, Wherefore, let them that suffer according to the will of God commit the keeping of their souls to them in well-doing as unto a faithful creator. What do we see going on in that verse? What about the middle of it where it says, According to the will of God, commit the keeping of their souls to him. What do you think about that, that part of it? What do you think, Micah? What does that mean? Commit the keeping of their souls to him in well-doing. Tougher. Somebody help him out. Try to persevere for the sake, like, <clears throat> for the sake of God. Like, Like, like when it says like keeping on their soul, I seem like my thing of that is it's like keeping in good condition or like like keeping up good or like keeping up maintenance on it. Well, there is definitely some exercising that has to be done in a person's life. Um, you know that is that is why that we are we are supposed to be iron sharpening iron. Micah, can you find Hebrews chapter twelve and verse two? Be ready to read that in just a second. It says that. Basically, God is the keeper of the soul, not you. But because he's keeping your soul, you should be doing well things, right? You should be doing good things. That should be how you think, the process that you come to the table with whenever you're, uh, whenever you're making decisions in your life. You, you really do need to take that step back and say, what would God have me to do in this? And you know, something that has been very difficult for me to learn, um, and I hope that you would you will accept this advice, but when de major decisions, actually just any decision, you know, start with the little ones, but any major decision that you happen, that happens in your life, that if you can take some time to go home and pray about it for a couple days, you should. Maybe even incorporate some fasting and prayer along with that decision, you know? Oh, um, you will save yourself so many tribulations <laughs> if you can do that because it is it is just I don't know in my own experience it's just phenomenal I got a I got a issue brewing and it's cooking pretty heavy right I'm not sure exactly how to handle it the thing that guys want to do immediately is to fix it total wrong approach okay I'll just give you some some more some more marriage advice, okay, or girlfriend advice. You're uh, if they tell do what? You're rubbing in my face, aren't you? Well, I, I, I don't know what's going on, but uh, I'm just saying that if if 
your, your woman comes to you and she's got a problem, she is not expecting you to fix it immediately. She wants you to listen. Okay? You, 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 you will venture into tribulation quickly if you try to fix all their problems immediately, right? Uh, basically, she, a lot of times they just want you to hear. They're trying to teach you how to do something. And, and, I, and you know, that's, that's what God did. He created a help meet. He put that in those lady folk to help you know that you don't just jump on, uh, I got to fix it immediately, wagon. You're like, okay. We need to pray about it. We need to pray about it. And if it's a major decision, don't eat until you get the answer. Okay? That incorporates fasting and prayer, especially if it's a, ma if it's a major thing. If it's like, you know, I just need to pray about it for a little bit, go home. I, I tell you, I've had... Been, I've done that here recently, and I'm like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna make, I'm gonna make myself not try to fix it, things when the issues come up. And I've gone home. I'm gonna pray about it, and been praying about it for like three days, and still haven't got the answer. Have no clue what to do. In an hour, I've got to make a decision. Taking a shower. All of a sudden, while I'm in the shower, God gives me the answer. That's. I don't know that he always works like that. He hasn't always worked like that. But I'm just saying, and it was very, very wise counsel. Okay? It was wise counsel that I, that I had to learn kind of the hard way. For you guys, that's free. That's free counsel. You, I'm not charging you a single thing for that. And God will revolutionize your life if you will let that principle operate in your life. Okay? So when the big things come, re remember... God's the keeper of your soul. Uh, I can't do it. I need to commit myself to doing well things. Well, part of those well things that's going to happen in your life is being able to actually pray, depend on God to give you answers for things, fast some if you need, if it, especially if it's a major thing. The scripture talk, talks about fasting and prayer. Let that, let that be a part of your life. Hebrews 12, 2, Micah. Read that for us. <clears throat> Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, for who the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. All right, so look to Jesus. He's the author and he's the finisher of your faith. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So when the difficult times come in your life, okay, we need to, we need to recognize the truths that, that we've talked about tonight, uh, especially when it comes to, to, to judging things, well, you need to judge those things according to the scriptures. Know that sometimes that there's going to be bad things come in your life. They're called tribulations. You're not, you have no get out of tribulation free card, okay? You, you believers are subject to those just as much as anyone else. And know that Jesus is the author and the finisher of your faith. God is the keeper of your soul. He wants you to do well. Part of that is recognizing, well, Jesus, he's there to help me out. And he allows me to go through things sometimes so that I learn to depend even more heavily on him. So with those things, anybody got any, any more comments? I really wanted to get into a little bit of chapter 5. Let me see what we got here. Yeah, we can do a couple of these, or at least one. Any thoughts on that? All right, we got a few more minutes. Let's look at 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 1 through 5. Isaac Doss, you want to take those verses? Sure. The elders which are among you I exhort, who am also an elder, and a witness in the sufferings of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. Feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind, neither as being lords over God's heritage, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd shall appear, ye shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. Likewise, ye younger, submit yourself unto the elder, yea, all of you be subject to one another, and be clothed with humility, for God resisteth the proud and giveth grace to the all right, let's look at, the, at this first part. 
Who is an elder in this context? Like, can you define what an elder would be? A mature spiritual leader, somebody who's uh, has much experience in like day to day, like Christian life, or like uh, has devoted himself to <coughs> learn a lot of Christian teaching. So, yeah, someone with experience, I'd say. Yeah, they they at least have life experience, right? Uh, they tend, to, in this culture, they tended to be the older men of the family. The father was the head of the household, even, uh, even to include married sons' families. So if you were a daughter, you joined someone else's family, and another guy would kind of be over your family. But here, uh, if the, the, the sons, when they married uh, women, that they would, they would come kind of under his umbrella, kind of like Job, right? So they'd be kind of like Job. Job would have been the elder, and he would have been responsible for that. There was a Latin term called paterfamilias or something like that. I'm sure I slaughtered that, that, uh, the words there. But it means the absolute head of the family. So a lot of times in the culture, these guys, they would be, they would be uh, you know, the men, the older men in the family. And as they come, in, as they come into the church... Or into believing that really uh, how the how families came into the believing way was because the head of the family would recognize Jesus as their Lord and Savior. So they would naturally become the elder in the church. They were already the elder in their family. They would they would kind of assume that responsibility in the church too. So they would have life experience, but they would also be the go-to people for learning the scriptures. And they, that is kind of how the early church would operate. We, we have seen that, like with Cornelius. Do you all remember the story of Cornelius? I think it's Acts chapter 10. It talks about Cornelius. Who remembers Cornelius? Kaylin, tell me a little bit about Cornelius. He was a Roman centurion. Yeah, he was a Roman centurion. And he, uh, and he, re he wanted Peter to come talk to him, right? What did Peter find when he got to Cornelius' house? His whole family, right? Because Cornelius, he wasn't just a centurion. He was the head of his family. So he brought everybody in. And what, what happened when, when Cornelius heard the gospel from Peter? You may remember? He got saved. The whole family did. The whole family believed. It was, it's just interesting how how their how that culture is so different than uh, than ours a little bit that the whole family is like we're all in you know if Cornelius is in we're all in and uh, that's a that typically make, he would make up that would have been the church and I don't know how big the families were back then but they, I'm pretty sure that his family was probably bigger than what Bethany is uh, so that's a pretty that's a pretty good church plant right there right one guy. Getting right, man, you already got a hundred people in a hundred person church. Now, something else about the elders is that it says that they were witness of the sufferings of Christ. Of, well, at least here, Paul talks, or Peter, I'm sorry, talks about witness of the sufferings of Christ. What does that witness mean? What do you think? What does it mean to be that witness? Things that Go ahead. To speak out for, like in Jewish culture, you would have to, like all you really needed for like a confirmation of thing has like two or more witnesses. Feel like they just treated <clears throat> such thing in high regard. So it's just like being being witness for Christ. Like I can attest to like him influencing my life. I can attest to like these things like being true. Right. When the when the scripture. In some places, it uses that same word, witness, as martyr. How do you think that that relates to that word, witness? Well, martyrs are kind of a witness. They are a witness, right? It's, it is something that they're willing to die for, right? Mm -hmm. And that's what Peter is saying. He's like, I'm not just a regular, I'm just not testifying of these things, but your brother... But I'm willing to die for these things, right? 
I'm willing to die for, for these things. And then he says, the partake, partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. What do, you, what do y'all see in that part of it? Also, this is still verse 1. Partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. What do you think Peter is trying to, trying to tell us there? He's talking to these people, and I think in Babylon is where, where this is at. And he says, I'm a, I'm a partaker with you guys in this. What does that mean? Aren't you a partaker with your cast group? What does that mean? Yeah, well, well, yeah, you support each other, right? You support each other in the roles that they're doing. You're working hand in hand to try to make these things happen. Um, and here he also says that we, we are partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. Well, that, that's, a, that's an absolute reference to, uh, to the Holy Spirit, right? So what we see here is that when you are partaker of, uh, with the Holy Spirit, what, what does that mean? What do you think it means when you're a partaker with the Holy Spirit? You do things on behalf of or as a part of this group? You, absolutely. You're going to do things that go along with the Holy Spirit. Basically, if you're going to look at the spiritual side of it, is that your spirit bonds with the Holy Spirit. That the two become one. And that's why you would see Jesus pray the very similar things. He, he would pray that, that they may be one as the Father and I are one, right? <coughs> so here we have that. Somebody look up 2 Corinthians 13, 14. Um, Jacob, would you do that? 2 Corinthians 13, 14. Josh, would you hit Ephesians 1, 13? Noah, would you take John 17, 21? And... Uh, we do you want one, Sean? Yeah. John what? Acts 11, 23. John 17, 21. You said 17, 14. Acts. Right. 11, 23. Do what? Acts 11, 23. Acts 11, 23. What happened? In the Bible that I was reading, it's not. In the C and B, it, there's not one. Oh, really? Then I do in the New King James. Huh. Get King James. Okay, there you go. Can you give me one of these? <laughs> Usually they put it in like a thing. Huh. Yeah, 2 Corinthians 13, 14. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. All right, so the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Ghost. That's the part I want you to think about right there. That the communion of the Holy Ghost. Now, think about the communion. Now, some of you, you participated in the communion tonight. What did that mean? That you participated in the communion? You mean the lost? Yeah, but but what happened? Did you just look at the little wafers? Yeah. What'd you do? We participated. But, well, tell me what you did with it. You ate it. You ate it. You consumed it, right? You took it in. You had communion. That is that is what the communion is: is the taking in. All of that. So with the communion of the Holy Spirit, you take the Holy Spirit in. It becomes one with you. That bread that you ate will never be the same. Right? It is forever a part of you. That is what the communion is supposed to be. That's what it's supposed to represent. That when you when you take communion with <clears throat> and Jesus said, This do in remembrance of me, that you're taking him in. Right? That's what communion is. You're taking in the Holy Spirit. Who's got Ephesians 1.13? Josh? I got it here, yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Wherefore, I desire that you faint not at my tribulations for you, which is your glory. Is that Ephesians 1.13? Of your salvation, in whom also after that you 
believe, you're sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. Okay, so now you're sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Now, the sealing, I mean, when, you know, if, if you go to the store and you buy a can of beans, will you be okay if it's unsealed? No, you'll get lots of disease. Yeah, you're like, oh, that, I'll get a disease, right? <laughs> but if it's sealed, then what does that mean? Preserved. It's preserved inside of you. It's protected. And not only is it protected... Mm -hmm. But it will protect you. The ceiling protects you from some other outside influences. It, it's it's good to recognize the fact. Oh, I'm supposed to I'm supposed to bond with the Holy Spirit. I'm supposed to accept it in. I'm supposed to be sealed. John seventeen twenty one. Who's got that? No one. <clears throat> May they all be one, as your Father art in me, and I am in you. Uh. Is, is that it on 21? Yes. That they may be one in us? Is that the next verse? Yes. Did you? Oh, wait, they'd be one in all of us. Okay. okay. May they also be one in us, so that we may be one with them. Okay. okay. So here, Jesus is praying. This is, and this is a, uh, fantastic. If you want to know how Jesus would normally pray, John 17 is a full prayer recorded of Jesus Christ. So if you want to know how he prayed, this is kind of how he prayed. And he said, and he's praying for not only the disciples, this prayer actually includes you. He's, he says in, that those who will believe after this, that they would be one as, as thou, Father, art in me and I in thee, that they may also be one in us. So he, he, he is praying that, that we will be one together. And the way that we're one together with the Father and even with each other. Because here, here's kind of how the Holy Spirit works. Is that when you're a partaker together, that m not only does the Holy Spirit bond with my spirit inside of me, but when I'm around other believers, it's like I can feel it. And we even have a bond together. And if you've been born again... And you've done any kind of connections in this world, you know, with those who were believers and those who weren't believers, you feel the difference. Is that true? Yes, yeah, some of you have, have been there, right? You can feel the difference because there's a there's kind of a bond that goes on between the Holy my Holy the Holy Spirit that's inside of me and the Holy Spirit that's inside of you. And and they recognize each other. You you do recognize each other. A, a lot better and it, it's like all of a sudden you, you know you can talk to this person you can you can trust them it's like all the things that would normally take you know a long time to develop in that relationship it's like bam it's like I know this person already because the spirits are born Acts 11 23 Sean. who when he when he came and had seen the grace of God was glad and exhorted them all that with purpose of heart they would cleave unto the Lord. All right, so here that they cleave, they cleave unto the Lord with that with that purpose of heart. So it's like their hearts. That's that's really the expression of how they feel. They cleave that that feeling is cleaved together, and whenever you cleave something, it is becoming one. It's th does that make sense? You know, if you if you take some JV Weld, anybody ever mix up JV Weld? Yeah, a couple of you have. Yeah, you mix JV Weld, the two parts of JV Weld, um, it becomes this hardened substance. It will never be the two liquids again. It will always be that one solid state. So here we have it cleaves as one solid piece that you cleave unto the Lord. So that is that is really what. Verse 1 is, is really talking about, we're going to stop right there, and we'll take on some of these other verses later. So basically, just to kind of review this last part, is that the elders, they are, they are those folks, they're, they're supposed to be mature in the flesh. They, are, they typically will represent the heads of their households, not always, not, not always guys, by the way. I don't think I said that, but most of the time it was guys, but there are certain 
certain characters who show up even in the Bible that the women are the heads of the household. Like uh, Lydia in, in, uh, in Ephesus, that she really was kind of the head of her household. We don't know if she was married or not, but we know that she, uh, she was the one who was in charge there. And that we, that they are witnesses, that they are willing to die for what they believe. And not only that, but, and the, well, really the reason why they're willing to die for what they believe is that they are partakers of the glory that shall be revealed, which is really the Holy Spirit that's, that's revealed inside of you. It's not something that anybody can just see randomly, but it's something that you know is there. You know, you've had, you've been led by the Spirit. That's what the, that's what uh, the book of Romans will teach us, that those who are the sons of God are led by the Spirit. You know if you've got the Holy Spirit inside of you, and you are working hand in hand. By this we know that we know, and um, you know, if we keep Absolutely. his commandments, if you say you know him, you don't keep his commandments, you're a liar. Right, so, he, so you've taken him in, uh, you've had that communion with the Holy Spirit, you are sealed with that spirit of promise, and that you... And even Jesus says, I, will, I want them to be one as we are one, and our, and our spirits even feed off of each other. And just, and with the purpose of one heart, that we cleave together unto the Lord. Really, Jesus Christ. He is, he is really the, the, the substance that pulls us all together. So with that, any final thoughts? Let me pray for you guys. Dear Lord, that you would be with this group of young folks, that you would just touch their hearts and their minds. May they truly know you and your love. May they be led by your spirit. May they understand the things that we have taught. May they be able to, to judge properly and to lead their families and to grow and to be the elders of those families and that they will teach these principles, especially the principle of understanding how the Holy Spirit should guide a person in their life. So teach us these things and help us to uh, apply them in our life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.